Hello and welcome back to the channel. I'm Ed Ting, and I've always been fascinated by the art of conducting. You know, you can take two identical orchestras, two identical pieces of music, put two different conductors in front of them, and the results will sound completely different. Why is this the case? Is it the technique of the conductor? Is it the charisma or personality of that person standing in front of the orchestra? I was determined to find out. So as some of you may know, I took a course on conducting when I was at Dartmouth, and I conducted Mozart's 29th Symphony as my final exam. So I have spent a lot of my life around the fine arts, and one thing that sets the fine arts apart from a field like, say, math or science, is that in math or science there tends to be an answer to a problem. In the fine arts it's a little bit different. There's more a realm of possibilities that can work. And in fact, you could take several artists and give them the same problem, and they will come up with wildly different answers. But they'll all be correct for them. So when you go into critique sessions in art classes, that's what you spend a lot of your time talking about, is did this person succeed at what they were trying to do, and how can the technique be better? So you can talk about many different kinds of artists. You can talk about writers, and visual artists, and photographers, and sculptors, and actors. Again, many different realms of possibility that are correct for that particular person. And the same thing is true of music. There are many different ways to get the job done. For example, if you're conducting, there is no set way to beat in one, in two, in three, or in four, despite what some manuals will tell you. There's actually many ways to get this done, and as long as you can make your intentions clear to the orchestra, you could be correct. So one point of contention is, for example, beating in three. If you're going to conduct a waltz, most of the time when you're conducting, you can imagine an imaginary table down here, and all of the beats will take place on that table, like this. So if you're beating in three, it would be one, two, three. One, two, three. Now, by the way, many times you can tell what instrument the conductor plays. Violinists are used to having their hands up here, so a lot of times violinists will have their hands up here when they're conducting. Pianists, on the other hand, are used to having their hands down here, and you'll see them often conducting in their imaginary table down here. So if you're conducting a waltz, it could be one, two, three. An alternate way to do this is to beat a triangle into space. So it would be like one, two, three. One, two, three. The advantage of the triangle is that it's easier to see if you're in the back of the orchestra or if you're away from the conductor. The disadvantage of beating in the triangle is that many musicians are accustomed to seeing the beat down here, like this. So there is no correct answer. By the way, there are conductors who will do this. For example, Arturo Toscanini was an advocate of this technique. So having said all of that, if your professor wants you to conduct a certain way, you need to pay attention to your professor and do it the way they want. Don't go off running, doing your own thing. So in the beginning, when you first get started, it's too expensive and cumbersome for them to bring in a whole orchestra or even a chamber orchestra, because in the beginning, you're going to be so bad, it's really not worth their time. So what they did for us is they'll bring in one pianist, or in our case, two pianists, and they will play a reduction of whatever score you happen to be working on. Then, if the professor deems that you are worthy, he'll start bringing in other musicians for you to work with. So this professor that we had, he was from Italy. He was the conductor of the Dartmouth Symphony Orchestra, and he was one of these mean professors. <laughs> That's how he got it done. That was his method. If you're standing up there and you're working and you're conducting and he doesn't like something you're doing, he's going to stop everybody and let you have it. <laughs> So when you're standing in front of there, I mean, by definition, you are the most visible person in the entire hall. So all of your peers and the musicians get to hear this guy dress you down. Yeah, it takes some fortitude to be able to put up with all of this. I remember once I was conducting, and with this he would do this to everybody, but things would be going okay. He would walk right up to the podium, and he would just slam the score shut on you. And he would go, Edward. Called me Edward. He was Edward. What are second violins doing? And why? And what key are we in? Now, when this happens to you and you're not expecting it, easy questions can become hard questions. So I'd be like, um, okay, second violins, yes, it's, uh, they're playing an inversion of 
the main theme, the providing counterpoint for the first violins. Uh, uh, we're in G major. <laughs> you know, if you answered the questions correctly, he would just start asking you more until you just didn't know the answer anymore. <laughs> or if you didn't answer the questions fast enough, he would just say, okay, dismissed, you're done, next. And I remember one of the worst things you could hear him say was the phrase, what you doing? So what, what would happen is you'd be conducting and you'd see him out of the corner of your eyes stand up and you'd go, what you doing? So we very quickly learned that is the worst possible thing you can hear. The phrase, what you doing, is very often followed by, okay, dismissed, you're done, next. So this guy, he went to the University of Illinois, which is where I just happened to go to my undergraduate. I was an engineering student there while he was getting his master's degree in conducting. So because we had gone to the same school, I assumed that we would be able to bond over this. Uh, no. I can remember sometimes after class as we were filing out and some of us were trembling from some of the things that he had said to us. And he would call out after us, he says, you better be prepared Thursday because I'm gonna be really mean. And we were thinking to ourselves, as opposed to the way he was today. <laughs> so Wednesdays were the worst. Wednesdays were critique days. What they would do on the other days when you were conducting is they would video your entire performance. And then on Wednesdays, you would come in and they would critique what it was that you were doing. And let me tell you, there's nothing like seeing a 10 foot high version of yourself up on a screen making mistakes. And of course, when you do make a mistake, you get to watch the video of him coming over and saying things to you. And you got it twice because then he would stop the video and then he would come over to you and he'd let you have it again. <laughs> so in conducting, what happens is on the downbeat, that's where the note happens. But if you think about it, when the note is happening, it's too late. You can't conduct and instruct a musician to do something as the note is happening. It's too late. So what you do when you're conducting is you conduct on the beat before very often. So what you would do is you would raise your arm like this and it would give in character to the beat as to whatever the downbeat happened to be. So for example, this type of downbeat has a very different character than say this one here. And it all depends upon this preparatory upbeat here, which he referred to as the impulse or the ictus. He would say this a lot to us, Edward, show me your ictus. Edward, your ictus is not clear today. You know, your ictus, what is that, you know? And it got to be to the point where after class, we would say to each other, you know, Wendell, I really admired your ictus today. Why, thank you, Edward. Your ictus was looking fine today also. You know, I have some friends who went to Juilliard for acting and it got to the point where in the halls they would say things to each other like, how do you do? You know, everything got to be over enunciated. So one day one of our assignments was conduct the opening of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. I mean, everybody knows this piece of music. It's so iconic, it's so well known. And herein lies part of the problem. If you screw this up, everybody in the hall will know that you screwed it up and not only that, everybody will blame you. And they'll probably be right, it is your fault. And so he would give us this assignment, how would you conduct the opening of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony? And it turns out it's a bit of a trick question because this is an opening that causes problems for major orchestras and conductors even today. This is tricky to conduct. And here's the reason why. So if you take a look at the score, you can see that it's in 2-4 time but the symphony doesn't begin on the first measure. It begins on a measure before the first measure. And not only that, it begins not on one of the two beats. So how do you conduct this? And of course, this problem has vexed people ever since the symphony was written. So you could, you know, sort of do this half hitch thing, but you can try that. And in fact, it may work but I think you're gonna be opening yourself up to some risk. There is going to be potential for something bad to happen here. Also, the orchestra very often doesn't like to see you conducting in two different tempos. They might look up at you and not in a good way. So how do you do this? Well, he gave us an answer. So what you do, remember how we talked about it's a preparatory beat that establishes the character for the main beat. Well, in this case, you do a preparatory beat to the preparatory beat. And it works like this. So instead of beating in two, 
which is what you wind up doing for much of this first movement, you throw an extra movement in there before the first preparatory beat. So it may look something like this. I'll do it for you in slow motion. That's really awkward to do, by the way. <laughs> so there's risk in this also. Why is that? Well, because you're, the orchestra doesn't come in on this beat here. It doesn't come in on this beat here. It comes in between this and this. So where are they going to come in? There is the potential for something to go wrong, and in fact, things can go wrong. But there is something about the ictus, this preparatory beat to the preparatory beat that if you do this, the, in, the musicians will instinctively know when to come in. And this works. And not only does this work, it puts the baton in a position where you can begin beating in two for the movement proper. And in fact, if you do this, it can get you fairly far into the symphony. I mean, you, you're good 30 to 40 seconds into up to the second subject. Once you establish the beat, the tempo, the, the dynamics, etc., you can kind of let go for a while. The orchestra does not need you to be a traffic cop. So once you get past this beginning, it actually works. So I'll give you another hint. When you get to the second subject, things slow down quite a bit. It's still in the same 2-4 time. But what the professor taught us is because the music has slowed down, you want to be beating this in four instead of in two. When music slows down, you can beat more because the musicians have time to look at you and see what's going on. Again, once you've established tempo, dynamics, phrasing, and so forth, you can kind of let go for a bit until we get to the closing subject. Again, they don't need you to be a traffic cop. So, there you go. You can get all the way from the first movement all the way almost into the closing subject. You never know when the need may arise. So again, we all had our good days and we all had our bad days. I had the misfortune of being in class with two young men. They were about 18 or 19 years old. They both were from China and they both appeared to be musical geniuses. Yes, I had to compete with this. One of them appeared to have a photographic memory, the other was a piano competition winner, and it was tough being in classes with people who were much better than I was. So I remember one day one of the students, he was conducting, and this kid was actually pretty good. He had this habit, though, when he got into a complicated section or when he felt as if he was getting into some trouble, the baton would start to, he would start to do this. It would get like crooked in his hand like this, and you don't really want that. This isn't serious, but it's, it's considered bad form. The baton should be an extension of your arm. This is why you're doing this. People in the back of the orchestra can see you because the baton is an extension of your hand. So this kid, you know, again, it would start to, I'm exaggerating a bit, but it would start to do this kind of thing. And when this happened, the professor would sort of leap up and he'd start screaming, soap spoon, soap spoon, no soap spoon. I take that to mean that it appeared as though he was holding a soup spoon and was preparing to eat soup. But in any case, I remember one day he was conducting, he was actually doing a really good job, but I did start to notice, uh-oh, uh-oh, he's, he's doing, it's a little tell, but he's getting into trouble. And I remember the professor got up, he got up on stage and he stomped his foot, and of course everybody stops and looks around, and he goes, you have a choice, you conduct, or you eat soup. Pick one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So as far as the kid who had the photographic memory, I mean, he was good. Ever been in a class where there was obviously one person who was just better than everybody else? Well, that was this guy. He had a photographic memory, an enormous benefit to someone who's a conductor. He didn't have to study. I'm taking these scores home at night and I've got my nose buried in them in every free minute. So when you buy a score, a lot of people buy these. These are Dover scores. And students like these for a couple of reasons. Number one, these books are very durable. And number two, perhaps more importantly, they are cheap. <laughs> so there are a couple of issues with these Dover scores. Number one, there are some minor mistakes in them. I don't think these are very serious. It's not really going to affect you as a conductor, perhaps as even as a performer. But this edition, for example, 
the measures are not numbered. And I don't know why that is. There are other Dover scores where that's not the case, but in this one, we're working on Beethoven's fifth and the measures aren't numbered. So the professor said, you know, that's okay. You can use this score, but I want you to go home and number the measures because in case we have to talk about something and it's busy work, but you have to do it. So by the way, if you want a better copy, this is what they call the Baron Writer score. This is a beautiful book. I mean, just it's beautifully made. The measures are numbered and it's supposed to be the definitive edition. Uh, the disadvantage of this book, it's $65. So I remember one day this kid had this score open and he was conducting and the professor said, whoa, whoa, whoa stop, stop a minute. Um, I didn't understand what you did in that section there. You weren't clear please back up, go to measure 271 and begin again and show me. And so this kid was like, yeah, okay, measure 271. And so this kid is from Beijing, had this long black hair, looked more like a rock star than a classical musician. But as he was conducting, he would like, you know, toss his hair around. It was actually part of the performance. He's sitting there, yeah, okay, measure 271. And I think I figured out what was happening before anybody else did. You see, he was relying on his photographic memory, which for some reason had failed him at this moment, and he had not numbered the measures in, his, in the score, and what he's just doing is he's stalling for time. So as he's up there, you know, doing this, out of the corner of my eye, I'm looking, and I see the professor get up, and I think he's figuring it out too, and he walks over to this, to the kid, you know, opens up the score, and he's like, no measures! What are you doing? And he says, you're fired. Get off my podium. <laughs> so the kid does the walk of shame back to the audience. And he shouts at the kid's back and never wear shorts in my class again. <laughs> I guess this had been bothering him for some time. And it just all came out at this moment. And by the way, this is an advantage that I had over some of the students in class, one of the only advantages I had. I'm older, I knew. Don't show up at this guy's class wearing shorts. So again, I was not the favorite in class. And in fact, sometimes when we were filing in at the beginning of the period, he would be sitting here playing the piano and he would just shout out, you know, what am I playing? What's the name of this piece? Now, I happen to be pretty good at this. Classical, name that tune. I'm pretty good at it. And so I would, you know, shout out whatever, you know, you know, Unbell D, Madame Butterfly, second act, you know, whatever. But I wasn't his favorite in class. So what he would do is he would pretend that he didn't hear me over his piano playing and he would just keep playing because he wanted one of the other people to answer the question. He'd be like, yeah, anybody, anybody at all, shout this out. So towards the end of the term, he gave us an assignment to conduct the opening of the fourth movement of the Brahms First Symphony. So this symphony, as you may recall, has a beautiful melody in it that everybody remembers. And it looks something like this. So everybody remembers that melody. Everybody loves that melody. You wait for it. It's a great moment for a conductor, for the orchestra, for the people in the audience. It's just a terrific moment in all of classical music. What people tend not to remember is the first two or two and a half minutes of that movement are quite strange. <laughs> as simple and as melodic as that theme is, there's something really odd going on in those first two minutes. It's slow, then it's fast. It doesn't appear to be in any key. There's no melody. I mean, what is this? This is a very modern sounding piece of music even today from Brahms, a composer often criticized for being too conservative. Listen to that passage and you will see it is anything but conservative. And by the way, as we were preparing the score, the professor took us through this entire work and pointed out several cases within the movements where Brahms was, perhaps even subconsciously, working to subvert the very conservatism that he was promoting, at least on the surface. He was actually a part of the movement to break from the conservatism. 
So anyway, he gave us this assignment, the, not the big tune, but the abstract part in the beginning. And he would say to us, how you conduct, how you conduct, you, you know, come back, figure it out. And I remember looking at this and I'm like, I have no idea how to conduct this. <laughs> it looks like it's just one trap after another. Well, it turns out they use this piece of music in conducting competitions because the judges want to see what you do with it. See, it's not so much a conducting exercise, it's a test of character. <laughs> One night I was in the basement of the music building, they have a library down there, and I'm pulling books off the shelf and I'm looking for answers. And I happened to pull a very old score of the Brahms First Symphony off the shelf. And I turn to this section, and lo and behold, I find, I couldn't believe what I found, I made a copy of it, this. Some conductor or some conducting student had annotated this score from a conductor's point of view, pointing out all of the problem areas, where to count, where to look, and in many cases, even the proper position of the baton in certain measures. And I'm thinking, I can't believe my luck. This is great, I don't have to study. So I checked the book out, you know, so nobody else would have it. <laughs> and I worked on it all weekend long. So from Thursday night to Tuesday morning, you know, I know, you, I, know I said that Wednesdays were the worst days, but Tuesdays were, those were also the worst days because he would give us a lot of work to do over the weekend. Uh, and come to think of it, Thursdays, you know, those were the worst days too. <laughs> but anyway, I got the book home and I just memorized this. Every free moment I had, I just looked at this and tried to remember another part of the score. And I slept with the score by my bed. I would wake up in the middle of the night, you know, and think, oh, wait, I don't know something. And then I'd open the book and I'd look, oh, okay, I got it. Okay, I got it. Okay, so come Tuesday morning, my brain is filled with this stuff. Okay, I'm ready. Let's go. So I'm sitting in the audience and everybody's having their turn and eventually I hear, Edward, you go, you go. So I march up there with the score in one hand, the baton in the other, and in the beginning, it's in 4-4 four, four time, as you can see, but the actual thing you're supposed to do is beat it in 8 in the first few measures because it is so slow. So I get up there and I said, good morning. Today we're going to be working on the opening of the fourth movement of the Brahms First Symphony. See, he told us to do this. You always greet the orchestra and then you tell them what it is you're going to be working on. So I raise my hands like this and I get ready to give the downbeat and I get about five or six seconds in and out of the corner of my eye, I see him get up and he goes, what are you doing? And I'm like, what, what? Did, did, I, did I just hear what you're doing? And he goes, what you doing? And he walks up and he's kind of looking at me like this. He goes, get, do, do some more, go ahead, do some more. You know, so I do it, I do a little more. And it was a really strange feeling because I feel that technically I'm doing the right thing, but I'm not getting this feeling that the orchestra is following me. And he let me go not very much longer. And he goes, okay, dismissed, next. And I'm like, but next, I, I spent all weekend working on this. I slept with the score by my bed. You can imagine how impressed he was by all of this. So I pack up my stuff. I walk back to my seat. I just feel awful. I'm in the front row and I got my head down. And of course, he's loving it. He comes over to me and he looks down at me like this and he goes, so Edward, you still want to be conductor? Okay, so what happened here? Well, it goes back to what we were saying before. I have no doubt that this here, this, was correct for whoever wrote this. It was not correct for me. This is not the way that I do things. I should have figured it out by myself. Again, every artist is different. So over time, we got better. We all did. And I noticed a subtle shift towards the end of the term this sort of, I'm going to be mean to you, never entirely went away, but there was a shift. The criticism was more constructive in nature, and when we talked, it was more collaborative. And I can remember towards the end, we were working on the Mozart, and I thought it was going fairly decent. And I saw him get up, which in the beginning of the term would have filled me with fear, but I noticed I wasn't afraid. 
And even if he said something bad to me, I was fairly certain that I had gotten through this, you know, in a decent manner. He walks up on stage and he puts his hand on my shoulder and he goes, Edward, not bad. <laughs> so then he takes the baton from me and he says, I notice in this passage here, you were not exactly clear. Now, the musicians got you through it, but you can't always count on that. So let me give you a couple of options. So he took the baton and he did a couple of motions. And as soon as he did them, I thought, oh, why didn't I think of that? That's perfect. He says, you know, you try again. Let's rewind, go back to this spot, get through that section and show me. And so we did it and I used, you know, his suggestion and it was beautiful. It was perfect. So conducting isn't what a lot of people think it is. Many laymen think that when the music is fast and busy, you have to be up there whipping up a storm and putting on a big performance for the audience. And when the music is slow, you need to be all, you know, like this. The reality is, it's actually sometimes closer to the opposite. And here's the reason why. You see, when the music is fast, the musicians don't have time to look up at you. They're too busy doing their thing. You're actually better off much of the time keeping your emotions simple during fast, complicated passages because you don't want them to look up and then see you doing something and then get screwed up. On the other hand, the slow sections are actually where they need you the most. You need to be there for them to tell them exactly when things need to come in. Here's the reality. 80% of the time, the orchestra isn't even looking at you. This does not absolve you of responsibility because 20% of the time, they're still looking at you and it's not the same 20% all of the time. Conducting is very often a study in contradictions. The conductor is responsible for all of the sounds coming out of the orchestra, and yet the conductor makes no sound themselves. The conductor has all sorts of things running through their mind. There's a lot of information that you have to process at the same time, and yet the conductor must act as if nothing is going through their mind. I remember towards the end of the term, the professor said, your job is to get the best music possible out of the orchestra. It is not your job to be liked. If you got into this business to be liked, you have chosen the wrong profession. And I stopped and thought about that for a minute. I mean, is that true? You know, Bruno Walter was a nice guy. I remember a story about Claudio Abbado. He was witnessing one of Toscanini's rehearsals and he was known to be rather mean to his musicians. And at, when he saw that, Abbado thought to himself, you know, if I ever get to that position, I will never treat my musicians that way. So you could probably think of your own examples, but this goes back to what we were talking about before. Each artist is their own person. This is what worked for him. He wasn't there to be your friend. He wasn't there to be a nice guy. He was there to get the best possible performance out of you. So you know, at Dartmouth, they don't give you letter grades in grad school. You don't get an A, a B, or a C. What they do is they give you a high pass, pass, low pass, or fail. So once the term ended, there was a new kind of stress on me. You know, I wasn't in any academic danger, but I really didn't need a low pass or a fail on my record and having to explain that to a dean because you had to meet with a dean if you got a score like this. So I'm sitting here just waiting for the grades to come in via email. And when they finally did, he gave me a high pass. So you see, despite his best efforts to convince us otherwise, he really was a nice guy after all. So there you have it, a look at some of my experiences as a beginning conducting student. I hope you found this interesting. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.